Christian Parenting. Today we're going to talk about the importance of tending to your own soul as I'm joined by my good friend and brilliant leader, Dr. Jim O'Neill. The soul in me is God's gift to me. Now that is God's gift to you and it is beautiful and it is precious. It is not replicatable. There are 7 billion of us on this planet and everyone is beautiful and unique. I'm Jay Holland and I want to welcome you to Let's Parent on Purpose. This is a podcast for parents who want to thrive and not just survive their parenting years. Each week, I'll bring you an insight or an interview that will help strengthen your marriage, your parenting skills, or your personal walk with Jesus. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe, share it with your friends, go to letsparentonpurpose.com for more details, and if you really like it, you can sign up for my Things for Thursday email and get a copy of my Fun Family Conversations ebook by texting the word THINGS, T-H-I-N-G-S, to 66866. If you're a longtime listener to Let's Parent on Purpose, you know that uh, we typically go week to week to week, kind of doing something a little bit different every week. I'm going to try something different over the rest of this year and see if it serves us better, where I focus on a particular theme for a few weeks at a time, hit it from different angles, and then move on to the next one. And so I'm excited about uh, how this is going to help me with planning and scheduling, but more importantly, how it's going to help you and me to think about things for a little bit longer than we might otherwise. Uh, So we're going to start with kind of the core of what this podcast is about, really, shepherding your child's heart. And so over the next few weeks, you're going to hear from uh, a few different friends of mine and different perspectives on teaching your children how to think, family worship, serving in generosity. But today we're starting with something that if you don't tend to this, the rest of it really isn't going to matter. And that's tending to your own soul. I've invited on as my guest today a longtime friend and mentor, Dr. Jim O'Neill. Jim serves as the Director of Mobilization and Leadership Development at Frontier Ventures. Uh, Also, he and his wife serve as consultants and certified global life coaches for developing leaders. That is a lot of words right there together. To basically tell you, Jim has been on the forefront of world missions and leadership development for decades now. Uh, Jim and Sterling have been married for over 38 years. They've got four grown children as well as grandchildren. They live in Pennsylvania. They served for 13 years church planting in Asia, uh, and then another 13 years in leadership with two missions organizations as well as teaching in formal theological schools for eight years. Jim and his wife Sterling also launched the Next Gen Leaders Conference back in 2013, and that has really multiplied out over the years Uh, as they discerned a profound need to integrate leadership with mission, community, hospitality, and spiritual formation, as well as weakness uh, as essential attributes for leading the global church. And this is a really, really special thing that they do, where basically Jim and Sterling have a heart for gathering godly people to pour into the next generation of leaders, realizing that if we don't tend to our own souls, then uh, it doesn't matter how successful whatever our mission or work or even family routine venture looks like, it's going to fall apart. Uh, So if you want to find out more about that, you can do so at nextgenleader.net. I'll give some contact info if you would like to find out more about Jim and Sterling. I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, But I just want to tell you that you are in for a very special conversation. We talk about uh, the vital importance of tending to your own soul and how if you miss this, just the amazing damage that can happen. So Jim talks about uh, how he experienced it in his, in his life. He talks about ways to help your spouse carve out time for this as well, as uh, oftentimes we have one person who's an initiator in this category, but the other one might need help making that space. Uh, and I really want to encourage you, stick all the way towards the end. Uh, as we get towards the end of this conversation, Jim shares about the heartbreak that they had being a missions leader, being a a, a theological professor and missions organizational leader, and having a son who was in rebellion against the Lord. 
and how humbling and paralyzing that was. And so for those of you who are moms and dads who have wayward children right now, you want to stick around and hear that. Uh, and you'll actually hear from his son in a couple of weeks as I interview Shane O'Neill. And then finally, we close out our conversation today with Jim uh, sharing this really special, beautiful exercise that he and his wife have practiced over the last several years to uh, shepherd their own children's hearts. That you're really, it's one of those that, like, as soon as you hear it, you're going to know that you should do it as well. Take a little bit of time, but what incredible rewards from it. So enjoy my conversation with my good friend and one of my spiritual heroes, Jim O'Neill. Jim O'Neill, it is such an honor and pleasure to have you on the Let's Parent on Purpose podcast. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Jay, for having me. And as a bonus for me, I just get to hang out with you. Count me out, brother. Jim was actually Mr. O'Neill and then Dr. O'Neill to me uh, originally Mm -hmm. as as my missions professor at Liberty University. Um, Some of you guys are familiar with a couple of the recent podcasts I've done with Virgil Tanner. It's Mm -hmm. actually how I met Virgil was... uh, at the at Liberty University under uh, Jim, and at some point along the way, you allowed us to start calling you Jim, and uh, <laughs> that provoked a couple of decade fruitful friendship. So, uh, where are you guys living currently? Just south of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the town of New Cumberland. So, just outside of Harrisburg, our capital here in the great state of Pennsylvania. Jim. All right, Jim, you came to my mind when I wanted to talk about this topic. Uh, w- this is a new series on shepherding uh, a child's heart. And I know one of the major challenges is um, as a mom and dad, I can be so consumed with what's going on in my child, what's going on in their life that I will often ignore what's going on in my own heart. You know, you can run around and, and feel like you're putting out fires over and over again, or you're so, you know, the mission is so critical and important that, that you tend to neglect your own, mm. uh, neglect our own marriages and we neglect uh, what's going on in our hearts because we think that what's happening with our kids or our jobs is so important. You had multiple years, uh, more than a decade, I think, experience in the Philippines. And so, and you kind of do this, this is your thing. And so I just wanted to first ask, as you were a missionary, a church planting missionary in the Philippines, how vital was the role of, of tending to your own soul in being able to sustain the missions that were going on over there? Hmm. Yeah, good question, Jay. And, you know, relative to an audience, you've got moms and dads listening in who show up for work Monday to Friday, and then you've got ministry personnel for whom nine to five just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I'm in that nine to five doesn't make sense category. And we're in a church planting effort where it's all, it's all new. And everything you're doing is you're initiating and creating your own movement. No one hands you a daily job description and tasks to do. So self-initiative is absolutely huge in an effort and in an environment like that. And it wasn't long into our movement when I was, I was in our third church plant I was overseeing our field now because our team leader had come back to the U.S. Uh, We had a fledgling movement on our hands uh, with both the national church and the formal training we had crafted. And I'm sitting on top of all that. And I began to realize this is not sustainable. Mm. And, And so it was in that space that I bumped into The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. It was sent to me in the 80s when it was written. And, and what helped me was I began to understand that I have the gospel, I have Jesus, I've got the reading of the scripture and prayer, but I wasn't taking time for my soul. And, and if I'm not taking time for my soul, the people who will see it the quickest, the hardest, and the most brutally will be that family that I come home to every day. It's my wife and my kids. So the best question to ask is not, Jim, how are you doing? But Jim, where's your wife and where's your kids? And I'm going to ask them how you're, how you're really doing. Because that's, <laughs> that's really where the battle takes place. You, you can live 
in, in ministry, and I think you appreciate this. I'll bet you we even talked about this knowing you over the years. In ministry, you can put on a game, your game face. Absolutely. In, in ministry to go out there. But but that only lasts for a while. Mm-hmm. And the real you, the person deep in the soul, is the place that the battle takes place. And that, that's that was probably a late 80s, 1980s project. Jay, we had two kids by that time, our two oldest girls, born there in Bohol in the Philippines where we lived and served. And I began to carve out time for my soul. And then if I could just say this one more thing, Jay, then it dawned on me that there's another factor in this that I was beginning to have to account for. And now this may be most applicable for those of your friends listening in by way of ministry, I had to begin to factor in time for my wife's heart. So I was starting to set aside Sabbath time for me away. And then somewhere in the middle of all this, it dawned on me, Sterling needs time too. Mm. So then I would come home on that day. I would take the morning away and I would come back and then it was Sterling's time. And I had my favorite place to go to. And then Sterling had her favorite place to go to away from the home. And, and I, I, I found it was pretty crucial to give space to my wife, too. So not only then was I un, not only tending for me, as important as that is, you can't ultimately, you can't serve in a vacuum when you're on fumes. Right. But then your spouse and, and then, the, then the joy to see your wife come back refreshed. <laughs> yeah. That's worth its weight in gold. You know, the, the, the brownie points you score with your precious bride because you're taking seriously the fact that, yeah, she's, she, I, I, she's part of the team. Over time, it began to dawn on us, Jay. Sterling was probably the most amazing pre-evangelist I'd ever met. It was amazing the traction she would get with Boholanos. Well beyond me, frustrated me to no end. Honey, I'm the pro here. <laughs> How is it that you're getting out in front of people and you're building these relationships and getting into conversations that were the envy of our team? But she also then needed that space too for her soul. She's home with the kids and slugging it out there and our staff and so forth. So it, it, it dawned on me at that moment, Jay, this is a twofer. And, you know, I don't know, dads at home who've, who've got the nine to five jobs, right? Uh, and maybe you've got a stay at home spouse. I mean, praise God. By the way, I commend you for doing that. Mm-hmm. And then I just say, number two, figure out too, because how about your wife's time for her soul? So yeah. that, that two for became pretty important to us. Yeah. So uh, as you've been talking, a, a couple of the thoughts in my head. We are in a in a society where less and less people have the experience of the eight to four or the nine to five. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know a whole lot of people who have what would have been traditionally considered the regular forty hour work week. Uh, and then on top of that, um, especially in in this you know global pandemic that seems like it's never going to end, you're constantly figuring out things. So even if you used to have a regular schedule. It seems like, it seems like nobody continued to work at the same rate. It's either people's jobs radically changed where they were pruned or laid off or, you know, had to go home and work from home, or they got busier than they've ever been at work. Um, you know, it's just kind of wild. Some of the ones that, um, that you wouldn't necessarily think would, would jump up. Like I have friends that have a bike shop who would have known that, not only is a bike shop considered an essential business, but their business would go bananas once this started. Well, you know, that sounds great, but all of a sudden that can be a challenge uh, on your marriage. If, if like all of a sudden your business is taking a a tremendous amount of time, this wasn't how you had it planned out. Far more of us are mirroring some of the missions experiences that you had where you're having to create your schedule, you're having to figure out your schedule it doesn't have an on time and an off time where you're able to just walk away and leave it mm-hmm. like you were before. Uh, and the other thing is, is in your case, you noticed that you, you had this hole and that you needed to pursue uh, that quiet time that not just like I need a, a devotional time each morning, but I need these specific times of, of getting away and having the Lord speak to me. 
And then you had the light bulb that it was your wife. And I think this is kind of typically how it goes. There, in a marriage, there tends to be one spouse that's the initiator mm. and the other spouse. And, and that's not even necessarily always about leadership or spiritual leadership. It's just wiring. I'm much more in my family like, oh, I see a need. Then especially if it's a need in me, I'm going to work to fix it because that's just kind of how I'm wired. My wife needs that encouragement in her. Mm. Like mm. I, I can't just say to her, honey, you need to take the space to do this. I need to proactively help her make that space. As you know, much as we depend on my paycheck, the lives of our household depend on her a lot mm. more. Mm. And so it Good is word. more difficult for her to carve out this time. And so I need to step in and do this. Now, in other cases, it may be that the, the wife is a better organizer, planner, um, or initiator of these things and needs to help her husband get this time and, and spend this time. Um, and so, you know, yes, you need to do it for yourself, but you're absolutely right. If you're tending to your own soul and your spouse is drowning and dying, it's not going to be any better mm. in the long run. You've got a good, you've got a good handle on it, Jay. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think you've got a good handle on our culture and the continuum and that we're, we're just, the, 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 the game changed. It did. On, yeah. on March the 15th, the game changed yeah. here in the U S anyway. Right. You know, so you're right. And, and wrapping your arms around the complexities of that continuum, it's a head scratcher. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've done a lot of, um, a lot of research and actually quite a few podcasts on habit and, um, and how God has designed our brains to want to run on habit. Just a simple example. If you're driving right now, listening to this, and you're driving to somewhere where you're used to going, you're spending virtually no energy thinking about where you're going. Mm. It's just habit. It's routine. <clears throat> if you're driving, you're probably not really thinking about driving. You know, you know, kind of the pressure to put on the gas pedal, you know, to, to like, there's so many things that at this point are, are subconscious for you. And that's because figuring out things is exhausting. Mm. And, and you, so your body works to make as many things as routine and as many things as habitual as possible. And in the current environment that we're in, probably more than any other time in my lifetime, everybody I know is in a constant state of trying to figure out more things than they ever could. You know, we're at the mm. beginning of the school year. Do I send my kids to school? Do I yeah. not? If mm. I'm home. We homeschool like things that you didn't anticipate in January 2020 that you were going to have to think about. You are, and and these can do damage to it's. It's not that these things do damage to the soul, but but they they take from you. Yeah, they take from you, and if you don't pour back, then you're going to have a real challenge. And I I would I would just ask you, can you think of some examples? Of, of people or situations in your life where you have seen the crash, where they have, have allowed the taking and the taking and the taking, and then what happens on the crash? Yeah, you know, uh, let, let me start with me, um, Jay. I left uh, with, I loved my formal theological education. We went to Asia, serving the gospel, and I had a little bit of an implicit great white hope complex to me. <laughs> I was I was I was the Messiah, and you know, a number of years into that experience, it began to dawn on me: I'm teaching truth to these precious people. Just obey; this word says it. And over time, I began to realize I am not able to fully follow what I'm teaching them. And this pain that began to grow up in my heart of realizing I can't keep. The Lord's word, the way I'm calling them to, and there was this, there was this existential moment for me, of beginning to understand that I was not perfect, that I actually had to do some serious repenting in this process, and and it was this amazing three years into our time there, Jay. Uh, I used to call it mangayoko pasilo daan. It's a Cebuano word for it, and it's in English. The rough translation says it goes like this: "I'm asking for forgiveness ahead of ahead of time. What's my sin? Mm. Because I, I was I was this this prophetic machine with truth, and people are human, and people have souls, people have emotions, 
And I wasn't factoring those in. I was just calling everybody to be an obedience machine when mm. I myself couldn't even do it. And God used this, this amazing moment of repentance to call me uh, to take to start to tend to my soul. And my 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 study time with Jesus changed at the three-year marker. Where now I actually, and I didn't use these words then, I hold use them a whole lot more now because Jay, we as you're with us. And at times enter in with us this this whole desire to help younger leaders in this next gen space. You know, the greatest gift God has given to us is our soul. Mm. Everything else is attendant to it. And there I was abusing. I was an abuser of my soul and then watching that take place. And then I'd watch I'd watch fellow colleagues in ministry. And, and the marker generally, Jay, was when they had a consistent loud spirit. Now that's not to say folks who aren't loud don't don't have also a, a, the quiet spirit. But one of the beautiful things about when you're resting in the Lord through through replenishing the soul because you're pouring out, even if you don't even intend to, in your regular job, if you're just pouring out, you've got to replenish. And it's interesting in ministry, and I think you would attest to this, just watch people. And, and when their spirits get loud in this process, and we had a colleague on the field whose spirit stayed loud. And when we had to send him home, it just killed me. It was one of the hardest things I'd ever had to do. Mm. And you learned through those things. That, that was an 80s experience in this process, Jay. That was a tough season in this, in this journey of learning that we have got to tend to the soul. Because when your soul is tended to, what are the attendant beautiful outcomes of a soul that you're giving attention, no matter the turbulence of the storm? What are some of those attendant things? And these are the things that I've looked for in these years of service, just a more submissive spirit. There's nothing more beautiful than the mutuality of mutual submission. And that comes when your soul is, is at a place of rest in Jesus and then one of the other beautiful attributes that comes as that soul gets rested is humility. Mm. You know, the gospel is the great equalizer. I, I, I could no longer see myself as the great white, great white hope. And then I began to realize, Jay, when we were serving in that context, it dawned on me that if I had a heart to receive, God would disciple me through the Boholano, even in their unredeemed state. He told me this in my heart. He said, Jim, they're my image bearers. And if you look closely, you're going to see some of the imprimatur of my spark upon them. And that's when I began to realize, oh, my word, I can be di- I can be discipled by an unredeemed culture mm. if I had the heart and the humility to receive it. Mm. And so this, this the, your, your whole point. Uh, that you're that you're dealing with here, Jay. Before we talk to our about our kids or helping our kids and they're walking in their journey, husbands and wives, we have got to be calibrating ourselves, and that took time. That that was a that was that at that point, Jay. Now you're talking. That was a five year project for five, God to get me to this. That one simple thought. I'm starting to allow my soul to absorb more of the Lord rather than just looking for content to teach. You know, when you have the gift of teaching, oh, it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. It's because now you're a teaching machine. Content, mm. teach, content, teach. And, and but does it get lodged deep in the soul? And so then there I am. I'm sitting in the midst of that. And I am uh, I, I was just profoundly humbled by God. Profoundly humbled. I'm weeping. I'm at a moment of deep calling to the Lord. And you know what? The next day everybody's all the Everybody saw the difference. Something's different about Jim. And it was just interesting. It was at that point, in that third to five year window of time, Jay, our ministry exploded on the whole. Because God was doing this work in my heart and just getting me quieted down, getting me absorbing more of Jesus, beginning to see that my spirit was way too loud, that my motives were less than pure, and the Boholana was picking it up, and my colleagues. And so in that in that particular position, all of a sudden, my capacities grew in ministry beyond what I could have even thought of. But it's a it's a I really, by the way, I just beyond the fact that you and I are talking about it, Jay, I commend you 
for talking about, hey, moms and dads, we need to tend to our souls. It is, listen, every, every parent out there right now, I want you to repeat after me. The soul in me is God's gift to me. Say it now. Mm. The, soul? the soul in me is God's gift to me. Now that is God's gift to you and it is beautiful and it is precious and it is it is not replicatable. There are seven billion of us on this planet and everyone is beautiful and unique and the same with your kids. And, and so tend to it, treat it well, honor it, love yourself as God calls us to, as we love others and love the Lord. But boy, that work in the soul, you, you're, you're right on target, Jeff. I just want to commend you because if we can get moms and dads in the space, in this season now, right? In this very season of saying, okay, the world changed. I have got to recalibrate. Help me, Lord. Help me to recalibrate so that my soul is, 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 being, is being oriented afresh, maybe reoriented. The rhythms are changing. And then I, Jay, if, if I could encourage you, just beat this drum till Jesus calls you home mm-hmm. to get us all to the place of habits. So the muscle memory is, I like to always use the phrase, well, I'm back on autopilot, you know? Yeah. I don't have to think about the next thing and where I'm going, as you were just noting in your illustration. And and so I, that would just be some of the, the ways. Um, well, one final lesson through this, Jay, then I'll let, get it back over to you. You know, when I think that it's season of, of having to learn in my soul to replenish it, to, 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 to get the take in so that I am God's man to, to myself, right? To my spouse, to my kids, and to a growing movement. You know what? God taught me something, and this is maybe one of the hardest lessons of all. I was just enamored by what Paul was teaching out of the book of 2 Corinthians. If you want to understand Paul's understanding of leadership development, his seminal insight, 2 Corinthians, and I often argue it's not a bestseller in America. <laughs> so here's here's what Paul says. Paul would say, okay, God, I get it. Okay, I get it, God. You're telling me when I am weak, then I am strong. Because your power is made perfect in my weakness. And here was the thought, Jay. Are you saying, God, that I'm actually more useful to you, broken, weak, and in my limp, Mm -hmm. than in my perceived strength? And I only was able to see that in the moments when I was actually allowing my soul to take in deeply from the Lord. And I began to realize, actually, my weaknesses, which were being duly noted by the culture, were were areas where God says, that is how I'm actually going to make you more useful for me. And I, I was trying to convince God that I'm most, most useful for him and at my best when I've got my A game at the stage of perfection. Yeah. <laughs> and God, talk about being humble. Let's Parent on Purpose is being brought to you today in part by the Lazy Bear Cabin. This is a family vacation rental cabin in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of Northwest Georgia. If you're looking for a special time to make memories with your family while still social distancing, consider this three bedroom, two bathroom log cabin with a hot tub, ping pong and pool tables, as well as a beautiful scenic view. You're just minutes away from hiking, biking, lakes, apple orchards, and the charming town of Blue Ridge, Georgia. And the Lazy Bear Cabin wants to partner with you to bless a deserving family that you love. Go to www.lazybearcabinrental.com and nominate a family to win a free three-day, two-night stay. And while you're there, consider booking a vacation for your own family. Jim, as you were speaking, I was a couple of things really jumped out to me. One, just being a performance machine and how often I can get so frustrated at my child's performance as if oh, great they word. check off all of these things correctly, then I've done my job. And it really, I think it's a couple of things. One is, is at the core, it's a pride issue that my kids can do this and they can do this and they can do this and look, they help with chores and look, they do this and that. And that reflects back on me. What an awesome parent I must be if my child can perform across all of these different metrics. So one is that the other, I think is, is also, I mean, I can say this personally, I just hate chaos 
And so if my kids are on task with performing, then that's less work for me. Uh, it's less chaos. Um, it's a way for the Holy Spirit to poke at my own soul. When you said that you are, you are teaching these, these dear people in the Philippines you are aiming to reach. You're instructing them on things that, that God is calling us to do, which is true, but that you also fail at doing. And how important that is as a parent to realize that I'm instructing my children and I do want them to grow in all of these things. And I actually want them to get them all right. I mean, like ideally I want them to get them right every single time, but I don't get anything right every time. Um, I, I mean, you think of the habits that I'm 43, the habits that you would think of more than 20 years of intentional walking with the Lord would not be an issue anymore. And yet here they are. Mm -hmm. And the humility of, you know what, it's not, it's not when my kids just get it all right for a day that I've done the job. That's not even the point. First off, it, it allows for a grace-based parenting in my own heart. Mm -hmm. But also, if I don't understand that, I am going to crush the soul of my child. If, if they think that the only possible way for dad to be pleased is for you to get it or mom to be pleased is when they get it all right, well, they're not going to get it right. And, and so probably what you're going to have is a rebellion Depending on the kind of spirit they have, they're just going to either be a broken, submissive spirit who you really don't have the heart of, or you're going to have that hard bucking up spirit that's like, well, I can't make them happy anyway, so why bother trying? I'm just going to go do whatever I want. And uh, and how God, the other was, is how the Lord began to disciple you through this unredeemed culture. And, and just the reminder that there is no greater force of discipleship in my life than the attempt to raise the children in my house. You know, Jay, Jay, could there be no more important words out of our mouths to our spouse and to our kids than saying something like this? I really blew it. I'm mm -hmm. so sorry. Would you please forgive me? You know, it, it, uh, uh, we've got uh, four kids uh, all grown now. Three of the four are married. Uh, the, the third is a son. One day, uh, he just so <laughs> frustrated. <laughs> I put him up against the wall. <laughs> I was so angry with him. And then I walked away. Later, I came back and just had to repent. And I, he was laying in his bed. I got down on my knees. And he was a teenager at that point. And I said, uh, I said, son, you know, what you did really, uh, really frustrated me. And I just want you to know that, hon. But I do want you to know this, how I did it to you was wrong. And I'm so sorry. And I'd like, I'd like to ask you to forgive that. I, I said, you know, son, I really, I want to be the real deal with Jesus, but I get in the way. And I, I, what I did was, was out of line. <laughs> he looks at me and he hugs me and he says, hey, dad, I was the one who blew it. <laughs> And then he said this to me, he said this to me, Jay, and this is sometimes an amazing comment out of our kids to our own hearts. He'd said, uh, he said, Dad, you are the real deal. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew my heart <laughs> and I knew that wasn't true. But to be encouraged that, you know, we're making, we're making an effort here, you know, yeah. we're trying to plant these basic truths and we've got to model them first. Yeah. But uh, Jay, am I capable of that level of, vulnerability if i'm not first vulnerable with the lord and i need those resources you know in this process so i just you're 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 calling jay just want to affirm it again i i look at a deeply bruised generation i look at my son sometimes and his work and i say son i'm i'm so sorry the the, the culture we're leaving behind <laughs> and putting in your hands because it is so fractured. But I think maybe you and I, Jay, it, 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 can we do the simple things? Can we, can we walk with humility before the Lord? I just appreciate the call God's placed upon you. Speaking of your son, I'll go ahead and give a teaser. Shane O'Neill is going to be a guest on an upcoming Let's Train on Purpose podcast, not too far in the future. And uh, he's going to share his story, which included a very significant period of rebellion against the Lord. And I just, I, I, I wonder, here you are, missionary, 
you know, to another country, taking the gospel to a place where Jesus has never really been worshipped, leading missions organizations when you came back to the U.S., professor at a Christian college, professor at another Christian college, and and um, and, and Doctor yeah. O'Neill, Doctor O'Neill, <laughs> uh, and you can't control your son's rebellion against the Lord. Yeah, what did that do to you? Oh, it was humbling. Jay, it was humbling. I do appreciate it. Shane and I were chatting a little bit ago, and he he told me that you guys were going to be chatting it. Maybe for your audience, Jay and Shane had a phenomenal conversation that you all need to listen to. And maybe at another time, Jay, yeah, tell, tell them how to show notes. Um, it's oh, it's good. Proven Men Ministries, um, a podcast <laughs> I did with Shane. So these, they, you guys, it rocked. Mom and dad, every mom and dad needs to listen on that one and the next one to come. Mm. So I, I just commend it. I, I, I said, Shane, you, you guys look like you, you show the, the rhythm and the, 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 the symmetry between the two. You was simply awesome. I said, Shane, would you stop for us? Let's keep going. But, you know, you guys have your constraints and I know that, but it was, it was great. in the process, I, I think for both Sterling and me, we each of us had to wrestle with Shane's rebellion. What was hard at age 12, uh, Jay, Jay, he looks at me one day and he says, Dad, I hate the sovereignty of God. I feel <laughs> like I'm being jerked around by God. I'm thinking, son, could you wait till you're 18 <laughs> to wrestle with those thoughts, please? And then there was an element of it where he just wanted to satisfy his flesh. And then there was a piece of it where, because I was a drug addict before I had come to Christ and he knew all about my story and my backstory. I didn't come to Jesus till I was 20. And I, and I think Shane wanted part of that. So, you know, it, it, it there was many nights when uh, Sterling and I went to bed, just, we, we were bruised parents. And then we were struggling at times with comments made by, by parents, you know, and, and maybe a bit guilty too, that maybe we had said that about parents too, when our kids were little and we were perfect parents. And now all of a sudden it's like, Oh God, Oh, have mercy on us. Please forgive us for the judgmental attitudes we have had toward, toward parents. We don't know mm -hmm. what's going on in the hearts and lives of parents, every home, Every child is unique and distinct. Every bent is ordered by the Lord. And a parent's job is, is they're just called to be stewards, not owners of those precious gifts. And it was, it was really tough for us. It, it went up to age 19, and we didn't know. And, and you guys will hear the whole story of Shane about the, the, uh, the heroin. Oh, my. And to think that God would bring him back and redeem his days. Oh, those are dark days. Those are dark days, Jay. You're talking age 12 to age 19 and trying to figure out. So I would take Shane with me on trips and I would try to keep him with me and keep the conversation going, try to expose him, try to present Jesus as beautiful, mm. uh, not Jesus the lawgiver, because that's what Shane saw, Jesus the lawgiver. And if Shane heard this once, he heard it a thousand times from his mother, Shane, God is good. <laughs> <laughs> Sterling wouldn't let up on Shane for all those years, just planting that simple seed in his heart. God is good, Shane, all the time. And of course, you know, he's got a gifted tongue and your audience will see that. It's a very gifted, gifted mind. He will twist if he wants to. And he could, he could twist, he could twist things. And then maybe for parents out there, you have a prodigal. I, uh, my prayers for you. Uh, my 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 respect for you staying in the game, for not wanting to punch the lights out, out of your child. I love this little quip from Tony Campolo years ago. I'd laugh at it now, but it's so true. Grandparents is the gift God gives to parents for not killing their kids when they're teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, you know, yeah. you um, know the day in our culture, Jay, our our culture. It, 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 it creates a narrative. It disciples our kids' hearts toward autonomy and independence and control, independent of Jesus, independent of his spirit, independent of the beauty of the family. That many times they don't even circle back to see how beautiful the family is in God's great design until later in life. 
And that's our, that's our task in this process. I so appreciate you sharing that. I recently did a podcast called My Non-Expert Opinion, and basically the whole idea was there's no such thing as a parenting expert. Um, the only I time- saw the title of your – way to go. Yeah. Yeah, the only time the only time I was a parenting expert was before I had my first child, and then I was actually still a great parent in those first few years, um, and I I could have instructed everybody. But then, as that child began to develop a will of its own, and then multiple kids kept coming. Jim Gaffigan, he he has a, a comedian has some kind of bit where he's like, you know, it, people ask me what it's like to have four children, and he says, imagine you're drowning, and then somebody hands you a baby, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the most accurate description of, of four children that I can imagine. But um, you getting to share the honesty and reality that even with your very best intentions, even with tending to your own soul, even when you're purposefully not just trying to obey the Lord in your outward mission in life, but also in caring and shepherding for your family, you can still have a long Previous period of rebellion in your own heart. And that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Doesn't mean that if I would have just said this at the right time, then he would have never gone down that road. I think that's important for people to hear because there's a lot of moms and dads right there right now. And, and I think the encouragement, keep tending to your own soul. Don't give up on your son or daughter is, is what we need to hear. You know, for for parents, th- this is a unique season, but this too shall pass. Yeah, at some point in time, and and if and when it does, and now try to figure it out. But as parents, set aside time. We used to do it in our vacations. We call it the calibration time. And Stir and I would sit and calibrate each child. And then during that vacation, what we would do is we would have breakfast with each child at our favorite little coffee donut place. And the child would come and we would process life together as they're growing up. And then things that we saw and then things that we wanted to encourage them on in this next year and their pursuits of Jesus. And I I think that's sort of calibration time. I want to encourage moms and dads, do yourself a favor, set aside some time away just to process under the spirit. Feel feel comfortable with weakness, feel comfortable with non-answers, but then but then also put thoughts down on paper. Because you do see things and you do glean insights and you are called the steward. Get them down, pull the kids in and just with some love and some honesty, outline that for them. And so now and follow up, the kids are no longer in the home. This is might be a great exercise. Start with parents. And if you do this exercise I'm about to tell you, keep a record of it because you can carry it with you with, with you know today's technology. Every Christmas, Sterling and I go to sit down and we write the, the this past year's story of each of our kids and now their spouses, and we've even started it with grandkids. This is challenging. <laughs> it, was, it was it was Sterling's idea, and and what we do is we we take this past year and we celebrate it. What what we have seen in their lives, where we have seen movements of goodness and kindness and growth, and skill development and and human flourishing, in the process, and and then we offer to them. A, a key passage, and then here's a thought we want to encourage you to consider to develop in the, in this next coming year. And it's interesting how the kids look forward to those in this process. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Let's end on that because that's such a, I, I want them to walk away and do that. And if, I think, I'm afraid if we start talking about anything else, they might forget. So we're talking about shepherding hearts. And as you start with your own, what a great way to help, I mean, to call out what you want to see and celebrate what God is doing. And I think that will lift not just your child's heart, but it'll lift your own heart too. Jim, thank you so much for for being with us today. Uh, Thank you for your heart. This is great, Jay. Love you. All your friends out there, listen to Jay. He is the real deal. I've known this brother many years, and this is pure joy. God bless you all. Yeah, let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the encouragement to my soul. Lord, for those who are listening, um, who need to tend to their own heart, God, I pray that they would have heard the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, for those who have a rebellious child right now, I pray for um, the comfort of the Holy Spirit and that they would not give up hope. I pray for Jim and Sterling as they pour out their souls on so many who are leading across the nation and the world, uh, that you fill them up. 
protect their family in the name of Jesus um, and God, that this would be just a season of celebration in the midst of the work. Uh, We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, I want to thank you so much for listening today. I pray it's been a blessing to you. And if it has, a couple things I would ask of you. Number one, share it with somebody else so that you can bless them. And number two, if you believe in the ministry and the Lord has put you in a place to support, would you consider becoming a regular supporter of Let's Parent on Purpose or a one-time giver if that's the spot you're in? You can do so by going to letsparentonpurpose.com and in the top right corner, click the little Give Donate button and become a part of our Patreon support community or a one-time giver. This is Jay Holland thanking you so much for joining, reminding you there's all kinds of back issues and archives at Let's Parent on Purpose and ChristianParenting.org for you to explore. And I just want to remind you, parenting is a marathon, not a sprint. We'll talk to you soon.